Hi everyone, welcome to this section on supervised machine learning. My name is Anja and we'll be looking at supervised machine learning models in Chime in this section and we'll also have a look into what machine learning models can be used for. Before we dive into it, let's first take a step back and look at where when one can employ supervised machine learning for sample classification. On this slide here, you can see an overview of a marker gene sequencing workflow. Essentially, we don't need to go into all the details here. Important to note is just before we can employ supervised learning for sample classification, we need to process the raw sequence data and derive a microbial feature table from the data. Using this my microbial feature table, we can then derive information about the collected samples with supervised learning, more precisely with supervised machine learning. Machine learning as a phrase has lots of different definitions. One of the first definitions of machine learning is the one by Arthur Samuel. By his, according to his definition, machine learning is the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So rephrasing this definition, we can say that the machine learning models are models that are learned from data. And depend, depending on the type of data machine learning models are learned from, we differentiate between supervised and unsupervised machine learning models. In supervised machine learning, models are learned from data where we have the correct targets of each sample available, so the data itself is labeled. In unsupervised machine learning, the data remains unlabeled, so we do not know which class a sample belongs to. You actually encountered unsupervised machine learning models in this workshop and when you employed principal component analysis and principal coordinates analysis. For this section here, we will not go into further details on unsupervised machine learning models, but we will focus on supervised machine learning. In supervised machine learning, we differentiate further between classification and regression. This differentiation is made based on the target the model tries to predict. So depending on the type of prediction the model is making, we differ differentiate between classification and regression. For classification, the model aims to predict a discrete class. A um, common example here would be to, the, to predict whether there will be a rain tomorrow. So our target would be a binary feature, so a yes or a no. In regression models, the aim is to predict a continuous value. So in this case, our target is a continuous value. And if we apply this to our ex rain example from before, here our target would be to predict how much rain will there be tomorrow. So rather a simple differentiation. Machine learning models themselves are frequently used in different areas and can also be of high importance or high relevance when performing microbiome research. There are lots of studies that employ supervised machine learning models for microbiome research. And here I just selected a few examples to give you a bit of an idea on what can be done. So the first example on this slide is the ECAM study. In the ECAM study, a regression model was trained to predict an infant's age based on its microbial composition. Another study, another meta-analysis study, um, aimed to predict colorectal cancer status based on the microbial composition of the patients. So in this case, this was a classification setting in this study. And the third example comes from a longitudinal study where 
the prediction of blood glucose values was the goal and this goal was achieved by enriching clinical data with multi-omics measurements. So essentially the regression model was improved by including multi-omics data to the clinical data. So now you know that knowing how to use supervised machine learning models can be of use when performing microbiome research. And we have now also refreshed our memory on what machine learning models are about. So now we can dive into the second part where we'll have a look into how, which kind of steps one has to follow to train a machine learning model. Essentially, training a supervised machine learning model starts with the data set. In our case, this it could be a data set where we have different samples, which are all identifiable through a unique ID. And for each sample, we have feature values. Some features can be features that describe the sample's metadata, and other features can be um, the frequencies of a certain sequence variant in each sample. There's also other kinds of features you might have depending on the use case. Another thing, additionally to the input features, we also have a target feature. So the feature we are trying to predict with our model. Starting off with this data set, we can then split the data set into a train and a test set prior to training our model. This is a very important step because we want to ensure that the samples on which we fit our the samples which we fit our model to are different to the samples on which we evaluate our model on. Here the fraction splits um, are usually performed in 80 to 20 percent but this is also you can choose here whatever fits your use case best. Also one way is to simply split the samples um, by fractions in the train and test. There are more complicated ways of splitting your data, such as cross-validation or nested cross-validation. If you're interested here, just have a look online. There's lots of information on how to perform this. If there's any question to it, I'm happy to answer them in the Q&A session, or you can post them on the Chime forum. So now we split our data into a train and a test set. In the next step, we select the train set and fit our model to it, train our model on the train set. Before we do that, we want to select the features which should be the ones the model considers. So here you are free to choose based on your use case, whether you only want to use features that are um, that reflect the microbial composition of the samples or whether you also would like to include some metadata information. In any case, you just have to be sure to ensure <laughs> that the target you are trying to predict is not somehow reflected in the input features you are providing it the model with. Essentially, what we want to avoid is that in this case, if we're trying to predict the age in months, we want to avoid that there is an input feature that is the age in days, for example. Um, in case at one point your model is really, really good at predicting the target, this is a check you should make for sure. As these sorts of transformations are very easy to learn by any model. So we train our model and by while training it, we define a certain loss that should be minimized. So once the loss is at its minimum, our model is trained. And we can proceed to the third step. In the third step, we use our trained model and employ it to samples that it has never seen before. And we use it then on the test set. So we apply our model to the test set and then we define a sort of certain model performance metric that gives us a quantification on how well did the model perform on this unseen test set. Essentially, these are the three steps that are the most basic steps 
for training a supervised machine learning model. To perform these steps in Chime, you, the, you essentially just need to perform one command with the Q2 sample classifier plugin. You will be using this plugin in the tutorial that will follow after this session here. Um, but here, just a brief overview on what this command looks like. So when using Q2 sample classifier, you define whether you are training a regressor or a classifier. You then further define the input features you'd like to use. So whether it's only microbial the microbial composition of the samples or also some additional metadata. And then you further define what the model aims to predict. What is your target? And then you also define the type of model you'd like to use. There you have different options within the Q2 sample classifier plugin. And depending on which model you choose, you need to, or you can, or you need to further define additional hyperparameter values. And to end the command, you simply provide it the folder location where all the models outputs should be saved to. So looks rather simple, right? Now, in the next section, we will have a look into two use cases on where we will have a look at what sorts of outputs does Q2 sample classifier provide us with and how can we essentially analyze these outputs? What kind of information is provided in these outputs? For this, we'll have the first use case that is a regression setting. The data set we're using for this regression is the ECAM study. The ECAM study is a longitudinal study of an infant's microbiota, where the microbial composition was sequenced from an infant starting at birth until two years of age. And in this setting, we're our goal here in a regression model is to predict an infant's age given its microbial composition. And assuming we now train the regression model as defined before on the slide before in Chime, we would get per default the following model performance output. And we'll now have a look into the model performance output of this regression model with Chime view. Chime 2 view. So we trained a regression model and what we get as a, a model performance metric here, model performance information, is a scatter plot. In the scatter plot we have on the y-axis the predicted target value and on the x-axis the true target value. Essentially in our case the target is an infant's age. Each of these gray dots in the scatter plot represent one sample from our test dataset. And the gray line here is a regression fitted to the test samples with the 95% confidence interval in gray shade around it. And the dotted line in the middle is essentially the regression line of a perfect model. This would be the regression line if our model predicted each infant's age correctly. Comparing this dotted line to our regression line, we see that our model predicts an infant's age quite correctly. There is a slight overestimation of an infant's age at lower values and a slight over prediction, sorry, and a slight under prediction at higher values. And additional information we get from this model performance output in Chime it are common statistical measures of evaluating a regression model below here in a table. Here, for example, we can see the R squared value which shows us how much of the total variation in the data is explained by our model. So we see our model explains roughly 86% of the total variation, which is, which is considerable. 
and further there's p-values and we also get an information on what the slope and the intercept of our regression line is. So lots of information available when using, when training a regression model with Q2 sample classifier. Let's now have a look into what sorts of outputs we can get from CHIME 2 when training a classification model. We will again use the data set from the ECAM study, but in this case we'll predict an infant's delivery mode based on the microbial composition of the infant at six months of age. And as the delivery mode is a discrete has, is a discrete value. We have the options of vaginal mode or caesarean mode. This is a classification setting. So assuming we again used Q2 sample classifier to train the classification model, we will now have a look into what sort of model performance output we can get. So in this file here, what we can see first is a confusion matrix. So up here, this is called a confusion matrix. A confusion matrix displays the true label of all the samples from the test set with their predicted labels with our trained models. So we see these 37 samples from the test set. Some of them were, pre the class of some of them was predicted correctly and the class of some of them was not predicted correctly. In our case, it seems like our model manages to quite well predict the, the infants that were delivered through a vaginal mode, but it rather frequently misclassifies infants that have been delivered through a caesarean mode. The information that is visualized here in colors above, we can also find that information below in a table with the actual fractions of samples that were classified correctly and were not classified correctly. Additionally, in the table below, we get an estimation on the model's accuracy. And we can compare this model's accuracy to a so-called baseline accuracy. This baseline accuracy represents a model that only predicts the more frequent class. And Comparing the overall model's accuracy to this baseline accuracy, we can see how much better or worse does our model predict compared to a baseline model. In our case here, we can see that our model essentially has the same accuracy as the baseline accuracy, so it essentially performs the same as if we had just been predicting vaginal mode for all the samples in the test set. So this is something one would need to go further into and find out whether there is a way to improve the model above a baseline accuracy or whether the data is just not sufficient to train a better model on. Additional information we get for a classification model are receiver operating characteristic curves. These are abbreviated as rock curves. So a receiver operating characteristic curve, a rock curve, is essentially it plots the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. Uh, easier understandable word for true positive rate is the probability of detection. So it plots the probability of detection versus the probability of false alarm. When we train a classification model, usually the output we get from the classification model for each sample is a probability that the sample belongs to a certain class. And to get a receiver operating curve, we then essentially choose all possible thresholds for this predicted probability and plot the rates at these thresholds. With that, we then receive this rock curve for our model. And depending on how we average different samples to achieve these rates, there are different sorts of rock curves we can get. So there's a differentiation between micro averaging and macro averaging. Details about that can be found on the scikit-learn page. Um, if you have any questions for that, please feel free to ask in the Q&A session. 
essentially something very important I missed to mention for now for rock curves is we usually compare our model's rock curve to the rock curve of a model that would simply predict a class by chance, which is here this gray line. Our goal, of course, is to come up with a model that is way better than a model that just predicts a class by chance. So the further, the higher the area under the curve of our model is, of this rock curve, the better our model is. So the higher up the rock curve reaches here towards this one zero one point, the better our model. The rock curve, by the way, gives us also a very good way of comparing different models. So here we just have the model's performance of our one trained um, classification model, but you could just as well compare different classification models here. What we get additionally from this model performance file in Q2 sample classifier are the rock curves um, of the samples according to different target values, in our case, delivery modes. And of course, the values of the area under curve of these curves. So lots of information available here. Another aspect of a um, machine learning model is um, the feature importance. So we are not just interested that our model is good at predicting our target, which we can evaluate with model performance metrics like we did before, but additionally, we might want to, be in we might want to know which features are the ones that are most important at predicting our target. To get more information on that, in Chime 2, we can select the most important features and visualize those in a heat map. And we will now have a look into how that looks. So essentially, what we can see below here are the most important features in our classification model according to their feature importance scores. These features um, here are hashed feature names. So these names here essentially are linked to the unique feature name. In our case, features are unique sequence variants of the microbial composition of the infants. So what we have plotted in the heat map here is what is the frequency of the sequent variants in samples that belong to either of the two classes we're trying to differentiate. And the additional information we can find out here is that roughly half of the most important features in our model are similarly abundant in infants that were delivered through caesarean mode and infants that were delivered through the vaginal mode. Whereas about one third of the most important features are depleted in infants that were delivered through the vaginal mode and very frequent in infants that were delivered through the caesarean mode. So you can find out about these dynamics by looking at a heat map and you can derive also way more information starting here by digging further into what is this feature um, and looking into similar research by others. So lots of interesting outputs one can get when employing Q2 sample classifier on your dataset. It's also rather easy to use machine learning models in Chime. So now you know how to train supervised machine learning models in Chime. Um, machine learning models are rather complex and it's important to be aware of the pitfalls one might fall into, which is why I would like to close this section with this. So one thing to consider when training supervised machine learning models is to always compare the model performance on the train and the test set. This way you can avoid over and or underfitting. So by, com by essentially finding out that your train, that model performance on the train set is way better than on the test set, you find out that you have a problem of overfitting and so on. Another thing to consider is that you have to ensure that you don't evaluate your model's performance on the samples 
that were already used to fit the model, as this is essentially just cheating. Then further, um, make sure that the data set you are using is representative, such that you can answer your research question, and that the feature it contains have good quality. Essentially for machine learning models, as for any other model, if you don't have a good input, the model cannot become good. And the last thing to consider is, depending on how many samples you have available, make sure that you match the complexity of your model to it. Meaning, if you have very few samples, don't use the most complex model you can find, as this makes your setup very prone to overfitting. So this is already the end of the supervised machine learning session here. I hope you enjoyed it and I'm now happy to answer any questions you might have in the Q&A session. And after that, Anthony will give you a nice overview on how to use Q2 sample classifier on the Parkinson's disease mouse dataset. Thank you very much.